morning, church. Welcome to this morning's service. Let us, before the service begins, let us spend a minute or two in silence as we prepare our hearts to come before God. David tells us in Psalm 32, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we come before your holy presence in this season of Lent, we remember your Son, our Lord Jesus, who gave his life for us on the cross, taking upon himself our transgressions so that our sins are covered and are not counted against us. Help us, Lord, by your Spirit to live a life worthy of your calling, a life of purity and love, of compassion, kindness, and humility. Help us, Lord, to bear with each other and to forgive one another even as you have forgiven us. Bind us together in your love as we come in perfect unity as one body to praise, to worship, and to glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us say it together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear these commandments which God has given to his people and take them to heart. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods but me. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not bow down to any graven image. Lord, have mercy upon us, and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Lord, have mercy upon us, and incline our hearts to keep this law. Remember the Lord's day, and keep it holy. Lord, have mercy upon us, and incline our hearts to keep this law. Honour your father and your mother. Lord, have mercy upon us, and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not murder. Lord, have mercy upon us, and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not commit adultery. Lord, have mercy upon us, and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not steal. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not bear false witness. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not covet anything. Have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Let us kneel or sit as we come before the Lord in humility, asking the Holy Spirit to bring to our hearts and minds the things that we have sinned against God. Let us confess our sins then in penitence and faith, firmly resolve to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all men. As we say together, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our fellow men 
in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate thought, we are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and, and grant that we may serve, serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Receive God's grace and his forgiveness. So may Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Let us stand as we come in worship and praise and adoration to our Lord as our brother Joe leads us. Amen. Good morning, church. Welcome. Today is the day. Let's worship the Lord, shall we? Amen. Casting my cares aside I'm leaving my past behind I'm setting my heart and mind on you Jesus I'm reaching my hands to yours Believing there's so much more Knowing that all you have in store for me is good it's good, today is the day you have made I will rejoice and be glad in it Today is the day you have made I will rejoice and be glad in it I won't worry about tomorrow I'm trusting in what you say Today is the day Day. I'm putting my fears aside I'm leaving my doubts behind I'm giving my hopes and dreams to you Jesus I'm reaching my hands to yours Believing there's so much more Knowing that all have in store for me it's good it's good today is the day you have made i will rejoice and be glad in it today is the day you have made and i will rejoice and be glad in it i won't worry about tomorrow i'm trusting in what you say Today is the day, today is the day. I will stand up on your truth, I will stand up on your truth. All my days I'll live for you, and all my days I'll live for I, you. I will stand up on your truth. Day you have made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. And I won't worry about tomorrow. I'm giving you my fears and sorrows. Where you lead me, I will follow. I'm trusting in what you say. Today is the day. Come on, today's the day. Today is the day.
in our lives, O oh God. Indeed, you have been such a good and faithful God, oh Father. Lord, that we want to praise you, we want to worship you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your great, great love for us, Lord. When you went through all the pain, the suffering, the humiliation of the cross for us, Lord. You did it all for us. Lord, 
we are set free, Lord, justified by faith in you, Lord. Thank you for your grace and your love upon us. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let us say together, the collect for the first Sunday of Lent. Almighty God, whose Son, Jesus Christ, fasted 40 days in the wilderness and was tempted as we are, yet without sin. Give us grace to discipline ourselves in obedience to your Spirit. And as you know our weakness, so may we know your power to save through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated for the first reading of our brother David. Hi. Good morning, church. Today's reading is taken from Genesis chapter 9, verses 8 to 17. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. It is for every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I will set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and a bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When a bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is a sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Can you please stand for the reading of the Gospel? The Gospel according to Mark, chapter 1, and beginning at verse 9. Glory to Christ our Saviour. Mark, chapter 1, verses 9 to 15. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptised by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, Immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness and he was in the wilderness forty days being tempted by Satan and he was with the wild animals and the angels were ministering to him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise, Praise to Christ our Lord. Would you please be seated? So on this uh, first Sunday of Lent, we are beginning to look at the scripture passages in the church lectionary. And traditionally, the first Sunday of Lent uh, focuses on the temptations of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so Mark's gospel has a shorter uh, passage. And to bring us God's word this morning, uh, we have Pastor Leroy. All right, good morning, everybody. Okay, let's go to the, word, to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Father, we just thank you for this morning, Lord, and we pray. We just open our hearts, Lord, to your word this morning so that you may speak to us 
and that we may be drawing to, closer, nearer to you. So this we ask in your son's holy name we pray. Amen. Okay, so the topic that I chose, uh, the, at least the sermon title that I chose for this morning is called the Rite of Passage. And I think we're all familiar with rites of passage, right? Um, our universities here have uh, initiation rites that have come out in the papers in the years past. Uh, we've read, you know, we know of like um, hazing initiations that you know, US colleges do for their freshmen. Uh, in Singapore, and the rite of passage for every Singaporean son is, is NS, right? Yeah. So um, I, I've had a rare, this rare experience of actually uh, having, be, having served in all three arms, service arms of the SEA, right? The Army, Navy, Air Force. Of course, now we've got the fourth service, so maybe I should give that a try also, I think. <laughs> but uh, when I was in the Navy, um, the Navy, we also have this initiation rite of passage, and it's called the crossing the line ceremony, okay? Or some know it as the crossing the equator ceremony. And it's meant to commemorate a sailor's first crossing of the equator, wherever they are, okay? And this is a traditional thing that all navies do. Um, I think even merchant navies do it as well. Okay, and uh, for me, it was, it's, it's, it's something really memorable because if you haven't been, so you are segregated and you are cast on one side, okay, everybody who has been through the ceremony already has crossed the equator before are called shellbacks. And if you haven't crossed the equator before, you're a polywalk. So all the polywalks are lower than dirt, you know, you're treated like that until you complete the ceremony. So... As the day draws near, when you know, the ship, oh, usually probably on the day itself, when the ship does cross the equator, that's when they usually hold the ceremony. And when they do that, you are treated like dirt as well. Okay, you have to go through it. And what we did was we have like a, they, they will fashion a homemade obstacle course on board ship. Okay, and all polywalks have to crawl through this obstacle course. And then we are sprayed over, we're covered with all sorts of liquid and... Uh, and they give us concoctions to drink. You never know what it was. It's probably whatever was leftover food from the dinner last night. And whatever you can find in the galley, they just pour in. Okay? And then there is, I remember in my experience, there was, a, we have this, like, you know, we have an inflatable boat, right? Those rubber dinghies. And they will fill it up with water and pour all sorts of things in it. And it's brown by the time they're done. And then we have to enter one end, submerge yourself, and come out the other end. And you find noodles and vegetables and things all floating inside. And it just smells. <laughs> and you have to go through. And then if... If, for their own pleasure, if the shellbacks are not happy with the way you've done it, they'll ask you to go around and do it again. And until they're happy, you know, just for their pleasure. And until you reach the end, you meet King Neptune and you have to beg for his forgiveness for polluting his oceans and etc. etc. And until he's happy, and then they will accept you in and say you are now a shellback. And then you get a certificate at the end. Uh, so it is something really memorable. Uh, you come out smelling like I don't know what. <laughs> Um, and definitely the, whatever you wear that day has to be thrown away. Uh, but it's really something to remember. And you know, once you're a shellback, then you can treat any other polywalk the same way after that. <laughs> so yeah, it's something to remember. Um, I, I think I have my certificate somewhere, but uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't know where it is right now. But today I'm going to talk about another rite of passage and of something of more of a cosmic significance than just crossing the equator. And we've just read, uh, they come from Mark how Jesus, about his baptism, and then how he was filled with the Holy Spirit, how he was sent into the wilderness, and from there on after that, and then when he started his ministry. And Jesus' baptism for him, that marks right, a significant point in his life. It marks the end of his old life, right, in the manner of speaking, and from then on, he was set on a new direction. It was the beginning of a new one. And uh, it's quite clear as we see it through the passage. And if we know, right, if we've read at least four Gospels at least once, okay, we know that, of course, as the vicar just mentioned, Mark is one of the shortest Gospels. And, and every Gospel writer, of course, had his own unique take and style of presenting the Gospel. Uh, we see a different aspect of Jesus' life and ministry through their eyes and through ways that they wanted their readers to understand. And through their eyes, we get a multifaceted view of uh, Jesus' ministry and His purpose of his life on earth. So with Mark's gospel, his style is more like a fast action, you know, paced movie, right? He moves through the life and actions of Jesus so quickly 
and he focuses more on what Jesus did more than what he said. Uh, you know, Mark, one of Mark's most uh, favorite words you find as you read his gospel is immediately, 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 right? And he uses that word almost as much or if not more times than the other gospel writers, all right? So, uh, yeah, so let's go into the, the, the passage that we read. So in verse 9, we come um, to where we find the first mention of Jesus in Mark's gospel. And he's introduced as someone as from Nazareth in Galilee. And what is not directly mentioned, though, was that we know that Nazareth of Galilee was actually a town of very little significance. In John's gospel, we see Nathaniel, and when he was told by Philip to come and see, we have found Jesus, he's from Nazareth. And what does Nathaniel say? And I quote, he says, Can anything good come out from Nazareth? So Mark was showing us the humble background that Jesus came from. And Jesus now, here, was at the Jordan where John the Baptist was baptizing the people who came to him. And he was there to be baptized himself. Now we know John was preaching um, a, re a, re a baptism of repentance, right, for sins. And he was getting people to come, be baptized uh, for the forgiveness of their sins. And all the people from the whole region of Judea and from Jerusalem, they were all coming out to the wilderness, to the Jordan, to, see, to listen to John and to be baptized. And we know that Jesus, of course, didn't have any sin to be forgiven. So why did he do it? Well, we know there are a few possible reasons. One, uh, he did it to identify with us as humans, as, as part of mankind. It was just one of the many ways he demonstrated his humanity and, and to recognize um, our fallen nature. Another possible reason was also because he did it publicly to show that he was also turning towards God. Usually we see baptism as repentance, right? As a turning away from sin. But in that sense, baptism also is a turning towards God. And so when Jesus, although we know that he didn't have anything to repent of, he did this as a public show to show that he was submitted to God and he was intending to follow God fully. Another possible reason, of course, the one that we all mostly probably know is that he did it as an example for all of us to follow. I mean, if Jesus never sinned yet, submitted himself in order that all righteousness be fulfilled, right? Then how much more should we? So although these mentioned, these, these reasons, of course, were not explicitly mentioned in our Bible text, but Mark does make a slight distinction to show that Jesus' baptism was different from the rest. He intentionally actually uses a different Greek word, okay, to describe the baptism. However, both words, right, that he uses, one for the people, one for, the, for Jesus, was, it were both eventually translated to the English word in, okay? So I'm just going to have the slide up just to show you. In verse 5, right, for the people, it says that the people were baptized by him, which is John, in the river, but the Greek word used is en. And in verse 8, John tells the people, I have baptized you with water, and the same word, Greek word, en, is still used. But when it comes to Jesus, what Mark writes is, Jesus was baptized by John in, but he used the Greek word ace in the Jordan. So even then, there's a slight difference. Although in and ace can both be translated in, or ace can be mentioned into as well, it's very close. But Mark makes the distinction by using two different words. Now I know I'm splitting hairs here, but that is one of the fascinating things about the Greek language where it can be specific when it's needed. Um, and this preciseness also brings out another interesting point, right? In verse 10, as we go on, Jesus, when he came out of the water, he saw the heavens torn open. And now we might not think too much about it, but when we look closer, the Greek word also that Mark used for torn open was used only one other time in his gospel. And that's when the curtain was torn in two from top to bottom at the crucifixion. Now, it's interesting, the Greek word that is used is schizo. Schizo, right? So that's where we get schizophrenia, right? With a split personality thing. Okay, and schizo means to rend, to tear asunder, to split or to sever. Very graphic, very descriptive. It's not a peaceful parting of clouds as we see it, as we can imagine it sometimes, but a violent tearing apart. 
And just like how the temple curtain was torn into, the heavens were split open, almost as if after all these years of silence, God the Father was letting His voice be heard again, making His presence known here on earth again, and that it was time for the next step of His redemption plan to take place. And in a way, Isaiah 64, 1 was fulfilled. Let me read that. It says, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, and that the mountains might quake at your presence. And when we continue reading, we hear, see that the God, the Holy Spirit, God, the Holy Spirit descends, and He doesn't just alight on Jesus, but He comes upon Him. He fills Him, and He empowers Him. And at this moment, the Holy Spirit reorients him, sets him on a new spiritual path, and he readies him for what is to come. Which was, of course, to demonstrate the power of the kingdom of God here on earth and to eventually encounter the world's resistance and rejection. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's the same power that we need to live each day in a world that also resists and rejects the ways of God. You know, at our confirmation services, we pray for the Holy Spirit to come upon all the confirmants, right? So the bishop's here, and then he lays his hand on each one, and he prays, and this is the prayer that he prays, right? That they may daily increase in your Holy Spirit more and more until they come to your everlasting kingdom. And I think it's good to be reminded of this prayer, and this prayer was said for us at our confirmations. So then I suppose we should also seek and be desiring to do the same. To seek to live increasingly in the power of the Holy Spirit each day. The Holy Spirit set Jesus on a road of discipleship that saw Him to the cross. And I believe that as we live in the power of the Holy Spirit, we also learn to be disciples as well and to follow Jesus in the way that He took as well. So as the Holy Spirit comes upon Jesus, then a voice from heaven is heard and it says, You are my beloved Son. With you, I am well pleased. So now, this Jesus from nowhere Nazareth, right, is identified. He is affirmed that He is God's beloved Son and that God is pleased with Him. And then this assurance from God lets him know that as he begins his ministry, the favor and pleasure of God is on him. The Father is with him and he won't be alone because everything that Jesus does is rooted in his identity as the Son of God. And then now filled and empowered with the Holy Spirit, then he is sent. In the text it says he is driven to the wilderness. Again, you have to appreciate Mark's use of very evocative language. The word drove, right? When the Holy Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness. The meaning of the Greek word also means to cast forth or to cast out, to expel, drive out, force away. Again, very strong words. It's not surprising that this word is also used by Mark. When Jesus casts out demons, also or when he drove the money changers out from the temple. So in the same sense, the Holy Spirit casts, leads, forces, strongly leads Jesus into the wilderness where we know that he goes there and he spends 40 days there without food. Now, of course, the wilderness, we know, evokes images of Israel's past. The 40 years spent wandering in the wilderness saw their faith stumbling through the trials, the tribulations, the difficulties that they had of living in the desert. And these years were marked by sin, by rebellion and distrust. But in contrast, we see that Jesus faced his trials and overcame them by the power of the Spirit and through the Word of God. For us, the wilderness also isn't necessarily a physical place, although it could be, right? Early church fathers, sometimes when they, like in the early mon monasteries, sometimes were built out in the desert, in the wilderness, away from um, society and away from where civilization generally is so that people could draw away from um, the crowd 
and come away so that they can be in a place to meditate, to, to just be away, to pray away, and so to spend time in God's presence. But not only is it can be not only the wilderness a physical place, but it can also be a spiritual one. And we know that a spiritual wilderness would possibly involve trials and testing. Um, it will involve feeling dry and barren. And if you have been through a, a time or a season of wilderness, then you will know what it feels like. You know what I mean by that. Sometimes it feels so quiet. Sometimes when you, you may be praying, but you don't seem to hear from God, and you wonder, is He still there? And then you wonder why is prayer is not getting answered. And it can be a difficult time. And then the wilderness for us might definitely look like a place that we will want to avoid. And you may even be afraid to consider what would happen if God did lead us into a place of spiritual wilderness. Yes, a spiritual wilderness can be a difficult time. But I like to put it that it's also a place of spiritual formation. Moses spent... 40 years in the wilderness before God could use him to free his people. Growing up as royalty and in a position of privilege and power, in his pride, he took it upon himself, right, um, to free Israel from, Israel, uh, for Israel from their slavery. Right? He took it upon himself. He thought that he could do it there and then. But of course, we know that turned out to be a failure. And he had to run away, flee to another foreign land, far away. And the 40 years spent living in a foreign land, looking after his father-in-law's sheep, was the time that God used to prepare him, to mold him for his very, very unique assignment. And when God met him at the burning bush, he was the total opposite of what he was 40 years earlier. He was no longer proud and ambitious. And the scriptures tell us, and he was the meekest man on earth. So, rather than fear the wilderness, it should be something we can embrace in our journey of faith. And now, we're in the season of Lent, being the first Sunday, and we know that Lent is patterned after Jesus' wilderness journey, those 40 days that he spent. And Lent, beginning on Wednesday, Ash Wednesday, right? the 40 days which do not include Sundays, lead up to Easter. Now, these 40 days are a time of self-reflection and of repentance, and it's traditionally a time of penitential preparation for Easter. In the days of the early church, new believers used this time for fasting and prayer as well, as they prepared for their baptism on Easter day itself. And on Easter morning, if you imagine, just Easter morning, at dawn, just as the sun rises, they are baptized. And this would be signifying a dying to their old life and rising again to a new life in Christ on the same morning that Christ rose from the dead. Now, how's that for a very meaningful baptism? Today, Lent characteristically involves fasting or some other form of self-denial uh, we try to have more time for reflection and repentance as we come to terms with our own sinfulness and our selfish desires. And as we intentionally set aside time to give more attention to our spiritual condition, it would also be good to give uh, more time for spiritual formation as well. And if it makes sense to keep physically fit, and I'm sure we try, some more successful than others, maybe, me, not so. <laughs> um, but how much more important it is then to keep ourselves spiritually fit then? Right? We need to be spiritually healthy. So it's time. Take the time to have a spiritual health check. Take stock on what is good and what is lacking in our lives right now. This season of Lent will be a good time perhaps pick up on spiritual disciplines to strengthen ourselves. Um, I remember in my, in my childhood, when I was very young, because I came, because I was from a mission school. So, during Lent, even in school, we will be given like, um, I remember, I think I was probably in primary one or primary two. Then we'll be given this little worksheet at the beginning of Lent. And it had little squares we could color and shade in. So, like, say, if on a day, if you did something for Lent, let's say if you prayed, 
or if you fasted or you know, some other thing, you could shade and colour it for whatever thing that you did for that day. So by the end of Lent, the boys, would, we all would be able to come back and say, look, it's coloured fully, you know. And I was like, oh no, what if I can't fully colour it? You know, I was worried I wouldn't be able to cover the whole thing. You know, but um, at that young age, I didn't really understand what it was, you know, what Lent really meant. And it, at that point in time, it just seemed like, okay, so this is a time for us, especially just the season of Lent. We're supposed to be doing all these other spiritual things. We're supposed to be fasting. We're supposed to be praying more. We're supposed to be, you know, uh, giving tithes or whatever, you know, doing good things. And it became more of a passage of rites, things that we do just for the sake of it, you know. So don't let Lent be a passage of rites, but rather an opportunity to grow in spiritual disciplines. And what would those spiritual disciplines be? Well, I've already mentioned two of them, prayer and fasting. Uh, some other disciplines are meditation, studying the Word of God. And prayer, sometimes as we know it, sometimes we can commonly be misconceived as mainly as asking things from God. But yes, it is good to ask, and we are expected to ask things from God. And having our prayers answered, of course, would be a wonderful thing. But all that is secondary to what prayer is meant to be, which is a growing, perpetual communion with God. We often say that prayer is basically talking with God, and so it should be. It doesn't need to be pretentious or pious. It just needs to be honest and sincere. And as we pray, we also learn to listen to God as well. We learn to recognize the voice of God and know His heart. And as we develop our prayer muscles, He walks with me and He talks with me, right? No longer will it just be a line in a song. It will be more a reality in our life. So, pray more. And if you would like more exercise praying, join us for our monthly prayer and praise meetings. <laughs> All right. Fasting as well. Something that is very, really not talked about much these days. And we know fasting in Scripture refers to an abstaining of food, but for spiritual purposes. And it shouldn't be compared to like what we see now with all these health-related fasts, like intermittent fasting and the like. Right? The difference is in the purpose. Biblical fasting always centers on spiritual purposes. And there are different examples of fasting in the Bible, um, which all that can be a whole lesson in itself. But uh, for now, I'm just considering, right now we talk about how it can be a spiritual discipline. And fasting is a voluntary self-denial of a need or a desire, right, that we can set aside in order that we can concentrate more on a spiritual need. So the principle of fasting then can apply to other things other than food, and which we can use to distance ourselves from things that may not be contributing positively to our spiritual health. It could be TV, or social media, or even our phones or whatever digital devices that we're glued to so much. Uh, Richard Foster had this quote from Richard Foster in his book, The Celebration of Discipline. And it says, fasting can bring breakthroughs in the spiritual realm that will never happen in any other way. It is a means of God's grace and blessing that should not be neglected any longer. In a culture of course, consumerism, fasting is much, much forgotten. A much forgotten discipline that should still be practiced. So let's find a way to bring this back, to include fasting in our routines, whichever way it may mean for you, right? Now, other disciplines such as meditation and the study of God's Word is important as well because it allows the Word of God to dwell in our hearts, our minds richly. Meditation allows us to hear God more clearly as we contemplate, as we internalize His Word and study. But study is more analytical, right? And it involves the mind. And it involves reading, learning, observing what's in the text in your Bible and asking questions about it. Studying is also aided when we're able to discuss it together. So, for which is why sometimes Bible study in cell groups is so important and so helpful because it helps us to understand the Word of God as we come together to discuss, you know, and share our experiences and our understandings. You know, if you go for, I'm sure even you, if those who have signed up are going for Bible study fellowship, I'm sure that's the same experience, right? We take the time to 
dig deep into the Word, analyze it, ob take observations and ask questions about it. And as we go around and we, as we dig in, you know, and the Holy Spirit begins to show us more and more about what the Word means. And knowing the Bible better and being able to use it more effectively is something we could all aspire to. Jesus knew the Word of God inside out, of course, because He is the very Word of God. And this was something also that he used to his advantage. You know, back to the story, when he was tested in the wilderness by the devil, what did he do? We know he used scripture to counter the devil's use of scripture, right, in his attempt to get Jesus to sin. So spiritual warfare is real, and it shouldn't be taken lightly. Jesus was able to take on Satan on his own, but even then he wasn't really alone. We know that he could have called on armies of angels at any time. But we, and we also are not alone. When we face spiritual battles, remember that we are a community that has each other's backs. And if you are going through a wilderness journey, know that it's only for a season and that God is bringing you through to something greater. Hold fast to his promises. Remember that you are not alone in this journey. We've just finished a series on growing together as a family. And for that to happen, we will need to take active steps for it to happen. We have to be there for each other. And Jesus, after his encounters with the devil, at the end of it, we know he was tired, he was weak, he was hungry, and he was then ministered to by the angels. And the word ministered here in the Greek also is the word Diakonos. And it's from the same root where we get the word deacon. So the angels were ministering to Jesus. They were serving him. They came to serve and support him at the end of this whole ordeal. And then, of course, Mark, in his usual style, will fast forward. He would go ahead a little bit further in time to a time when, in verse 14, where John the Baptist was already arrested and Jesus returns to Galilee. And he starts to begin his ministry, ministry proper. He preaches his first sermon. He begins to call his disciples. And with a message of hope, he begins to declare that the time for the kingdom of God to be established has arrived. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we have believed in this message of hope. We have believed in this redemption. We have the privilege of being adopted into the family of God and to be called His children. Just as the Father declared His pleasure of Jesus, the Son, may we also share in that as we live in obedience to God. So during this season of Lent, let us choose to renew our relationship with the Lord. Let us reclaim our identity as a child of God, as co-heirs with Christ. During the season of Lent, let us also be prepared to bear the cost of being a child of God and as Jesus' disciples, knowing that ultimately, just as we suffer with Him, we will also be glorified with Him. Let us pray. Father, we are grateful. Lord, that even wherever we are, we can just come to you, just as we are. You call us, Lord, because you love us, and you draw us to you, not by any other way that we can on ourselves. Father, forgive us, Lord, for the times when we, in our pride, have ignored you and have ignored your voice and attempted to live on our own way. Forgive us, Lord, when we have not been willing to listen to your voice. But we thank you, God, that you are a gracious God who always welcomes us with open arms when we turn back to you. We thank you, Lord, that even through the difficult times, through the struggles, through our wilderness, you are still there, you are still faithful, you are still God, and you are a God who provides. So we thank you, God. 
We pray, Lord, that you will soften our hearts, Lord, even as we desire and seek to live according to your word, to walk in your ways, so that we can know and be blessed, Lord, by the assurance, Lord, that you call us your sons and daughters, your beloved sons and daughters whom you are well pleased with. So this we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us stand as uh, our brother Joe leads us in the response song. Um, yeah, I, I just pray that this song, we may, I know it may not be familiar, but it's a song and I pray that it will just minister to us as we, um, whether you're in a season of wilderness or a spiritual battle, but to trust in God and to continue to know that He is always there, right? There you go. And this is my prayer in the desert When all that's within me feels dry This is my prayer the God who provides and this is my prayer in the fire in weakness or trial or pain there is a faith move to more than that hope so refine me Lord through the vein I will bring praise I will bring praise no weapon formed against me shall I will rejoice, I will declare, God is my victory and He is here. And this is my prayer in the battle, when triumph is still on its way. I'll stand. I will bring praise. I will bring praise. No weapon formed against me shall be made. I will rejoice. I will declare. God is my victory and He is here. All of my life, in every season, You are still God. I have a reason to sing I have a reason to worship all of my life in every season you are still God I have a reason to sing I have a reason to worship so here yeah, all my life all of my life in every season, you are still God. I have a reason to sing. I have a reason to worship. All of my life, all of my life. In every season, you are still God. I have a reason to sing. I have a reason to worship. Weapon formed against me shall remain. I will rejoice, I will declare, God is my victory and He is here. I will bring praise, I will bring praise. flow 
I know I failed to be emptied again. The seed I received, I will sow. Yes, Lord, we just thank you, Lord, and we will rejoice, and we will be glad, and we will praise you, God. Yes, in the season of Lent, help us always to reflect, Lord, to commune and to uh, renew our relationship with you, Lord. Lord, as you have set us apart for your work and for your service, in Jesus' name, amen. Let us say together, as we remain standing, the Nicene Creed. Eh? We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from Christ, true God from true God, begotten, not made of one being with the Father. We, through him all things were made for us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and was in Holy Spirit. He became incarnate of the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified, he has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. First, we'd like to welcome those who have been here for the first time. Uh, just do raise your hand and uh, we can, our ushers will just give you a welcome pack. Any for the first time? Yes, welcome. Welcome. Paul, thank you for joining us this morning. And we have uh, breakfast later after the service at the hall, multipurpose hall below to join us for a time of fellowship. Okay, thank you. Um, just announcements, announcement, two announcements. First, um, yeah, a reminder, the book of Job, the study. The first lesson begins next Sunday on the 25th of February uh, at the Second Century, facilitated by Yiping. If you're not signed up, so far I understand there are already 40 to have signed up or so, but if you have not signed up, do sign up still, there's still time. Uh, to just come and attend this uh, talk, uh, this uh, study, uh, four-week study on the book of Job, beginning next Sunday, the 25th. And for those who have signed up, do remember it is next Sunday, the 25th. Okay, I just call upon uh, Rika to yeah. tell us about the memory verse. Okay. So, are you excited about scripture memory? <laughs> Can we have the slide on the memory verses? I think, uh, as was preached today by Pastor Leroy, uh, the call of God uh, in this season of Lent to grow in spiritual disciplines, fasting, prayer, and the Word of God. And scripture memory is a spiritual uh, discipline. And I thought it would be good for us to grow as one family uh, in this season of Lent. So there are six Sundays in, Le in the season of Lent, and uh, we have just finished six sermons on growing as one family. And so I took for each of the sermon topics uh, a key verse for us to memorize. So you have these in your e-bulletin. If not, you can also take a photo. And I pray that in the coming days, so don't wait until next Sunday, yeah, uh, that you can prepare Romans 15 verse 5 in the coming week and also revise uh, John 13. Okay, because scripture memory, you've got to keep looking at it. Now. So, um, so those are the topics. So we look at love one another. Next slide. John 13, uh, verse 34. I think we are starting with a easy, quite easy verse, right, this one. Okay, because there's also a song that goes with it. Um, so let's, I, I, what we'll do is we'll read it twice and then we'll blank it out and then try it, okay? So we will say John 13, verse 34, then say the verse. Can? Okay, together. John 13, verse 34. A new commandment I give to you, 
that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. One more time. John 13 verse 34. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. Okay, can thank you. Love. Okay, John 13 verse 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. Yeah. So, praise God. And uh, we now have a time of intercession. So, if you can uh, kneel as you are able and ask Pastor Wilson uh, to come and to lead us in prayer. Praise the Lord that He shines forth like the morning and is perfect in beauty. Thank God that we are His covenant people and declare His faithfulness and righteousness. Let us pray for the church and for the world and let us thank God for His goodness. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, You promised through Your Son Jesus Christ to hear us when we pray in faith. Strengthen us, Bishop Dr. Titus Chung, and all your church in the service of Christ, that those who confess your name may be united in your truth. Live together in your love and reveal your glory in the world. Father, we pray for the world. We pray your mercy and interventions as wars and conflicts continue in this world. We pray for the protections of civilians, for the safety of humanitarian aid workers and for the release of the timely resources to the needy. We pray for the countries that are involved in the peacemaking to reach a common ground as they seek to de-escalate tensions and find a good resolutions to end the conflicts. We also pray for those whom that has not heard the gospel. We pray that Lord, you'll be they will be given the opportunity to see the lights of the gospel, to know the glory of Christ and be reconciled with you. We pray that all believers around the world will proclaim Christ and shine brightly in the dark places. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we pray for Singapore. We pray for the President's Taman, Prime Minister Lee Siang Lung and his cabinet ministers and all in authority. We pray for your divine wisdom to direct this nation in justice and peace for the common good of your people. We also want to uphold the interagency's task force on mental health and well-being. We pray for your wisdom as they channel resources to bring health care support closer to where people live, studies, work and socialise. We pray that our government will continue to develop good programs to help the families and caregivers of those with mental illness. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we pray for our diocese. We pray that, Lord, you'll be faithful to provide many young people so that they can be raised as a generation of youth pastors for ministry succession. We pray that, Lord, you will convict their hearts and they will response to your calling. We also want to pray for those, for your wisdoms and your guidance on our Chinese-speaking words. Oh Lord, help them to navigate the challenging landscape arising from the language policy of our education system. May your hands guide your workers in their work so that they can navigate through all the challenges that are before them. We also want to uphold our Archbishop Dr. Titus Chung as he assumed greater responsibility, both provincial and in the global scene. May you anoint him, guide him, strengthen him, and grant him good health and always draw him close to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray for St. Paul Church. We uphold our vicar, Reverend Jeremy, Reverend Astra, Reverend Chu, 
the pastoral staff and all our church supporting staff before your throne of grace. That you will prayerfully discern, that they will pray, prayerfully discern your plans and accomplish them according to your purpose. We pray for all our church members as we journey through the seasons of land. We come before you with hearts open to your love and grace. We thank you for the opportunity to walk alongside with each other in reflections, repentance, and renewal. Grant us the strength to embrace this sacred time with humility and sincerity as we seek to draw closer to you. Help us to remember the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ, and the immense love that, he had, that led him to the cross. We also pray for our young adults, youth and children in our church. We pray that your continual presence and the Holy Spirit will transform their life and, en and enable them to grow to be more Christ-like in their personal lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to you, your fatherly goodness, all who are anxious or distressed in mind or body. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind or spirit. Lord, we pray for Lynette Sia, Mrs. Raman, David Lo, Ellen and He Chai, Linda Milner and William Lim. Give them the courage and hope in their trouble and bring them to the joy of your salvation. O oh Lord, we pray that you would ease their aches and pain, grant them complete recovery, and strengthen their bones and joints, and let your presence be their peace and comfort and strength, and assuring them that you are always with them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Father, Accept this prayer for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Shall we stand as we share the peace with one another? We are the body of Christ. In the one spirit, we were all baptised into one body. Let us then pursue all that makes for peace and builds up our common life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. We share the peace with one another.